And now, moving back to the plenary sessions, we're going to be rejoined by hopefully all of you viewers, listeners in thematic sessions two and three, which are all coming to a close, I hear, all at once, which is fantastic timekeeping. And as mentioned at the very top of this afternoon, very sadly, Alberto Cairo cannot be with us due to health reasons, but Matteo Moretti has wonderfully stepped in to fill the breach. So ever so grateful to you, Matteo, uh, for, for revamping your talk to fill the gap. Matteo Moretti is the co-founder of Sheldon.studio in Italy, Turin, I believe, the first studio working on information experience design. And amongst various awards, he has won the 2015 Data Journalism Award, the 2016 and 17 European Design Award. And this title is entitled, this talk rather, is entitled Opening the Open Data. We'll get the chance to discover two projects, one on climate change and the other on mapping diversity. So over to you, Matteo, for Opening the Open Data. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. And yes, I start with sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. So let's start. Hello, everybody. First of all, my name is Matteo. I'm a designer and co-founder of Sheldon.studio. We are a small but powerful studio founded by three partners right before the pandemic. Luckily, we survived the stress test and now we are in a good health and in six people plus a dog. We are not based in Turin, so sorry, but we are based in Bozza and Bolzano uh, in South Tyrol, always in Italy, but on the other side, we are close to the Austrian border. And yes, we painted an incredible rainbow in our studio. We work at the intersection of data, design and society. So compared to a traditional information design studio, we make a further sense of data and design. In fact, we work with a strong social vocation, unfolding the complexity of reality to a broader and unexperienced audience. We used to say that we design informative experiences. So very briefly, let me explain what does it mean. The concept is made by two main keywords. On the left, we have information, which is something indirect, so produced by others. For instance, we watch information or we listen to it in case of podcast or radio. On the other side, on the right side, we find experiences which are direct. We live them through our senses and through our bodies. And very important, we also have a memory of them. So the challenge is, how to shorten the distance between information and experience, or just to be more pragmatic, how to turn information into a more immersive and engaging experience, or finally looking at, at it from the, the other side, how design experiences that inform us. This is what we explore every day at Sheldon.studio. So we design digital and physical experiences that inform a broader audience on complex and multifaceted issues. Just to be clear, it doesn't mean we pretend to explain the complexity. Please forget it. It's practically impossible, especially through a single design project. Instead, we love to stress the concept that social, economic, political, and environmental issues are complex things. Because reality is much more complex than it is advertised, and sometimes it's pretty difficult taking a clear position on the debates. Just think of the climate change, the need to reduce our emission, change our habits, uh, especially on a global level. So we are part of an incredible and risky mess. And then I could continue with other crucial topics such as the migration or the COVID or the green certification. What a mess. But yes, in this mess, open data may support a better informed debate, especially if turned into digital commons. So what are digital commons? If you're asking yourself this question, probably you already know them. Wikipedia, OpenStreetMap, Internet Archive, or 
or all the forms of open software and open data are the so-called digital commons. So by definition are all those digital data information tools available to citizens that at the same time, they also take care of them. Exactly as in Wikipedia, for instance, we can contribute as well as in the open source software or open data. So we use them, but we can also contribute, extending them, making them better pro and so on. But there's something more. Um, yes, sorry, wrong slide. Digital common care practices include their maintenance, but also other forms like creative use, education, and engagement of a broader audience. Obviously, in this context, designers, activists, and experts may have a crucial role in designing and taking care of digital commons. Now that I clarified what digital, sorry, digital commons means and are, let's move on the open data, which is the topic of today. Open data has great potential. It represents a different and often a powerful lens through which we look at our society or inform decisions or build our perception of the outside world. But as soon as we try to work with open data, we run into a problem. Dealing with open data needs special skills shared only by a restricted group of insiders, not all the citizens. For this reason, we must open the open data to release its potential to a broader audience to inspire new forms of awareness, activism, and basically participation. We must democratize the data culture toward more conscious and active citizens. But it's a long time process. If you mind, for instance, that we spent more or less 20 years, especially in Italy, before realizing that what was on television sometimes may lie or that we spent almost 10 years after the web 2.0 invention to realize the toxic power of fake news and the importance of media and graphical literacy among the population just to say that dealing with tech new technology and learning new skills and competencies need time sometimes a lot of time so what can we do in the meantime? For sure, we can wait for other 10 years so that people will learn how to work with data, but probably it will be too late. And now probably you got the answer. Designers, experts, activists can bridge the gap by designing digital commons, such as interfaces, platforms, services that open the open data to a broader population and also supporting sometimes the, the learning and the, the literacy. Yes, but how? In order to try answering that, I brought two case studies for today, which we designed in this year, Glocal Climate Change and Mapping Diversity. In a similar way, both projects shorten the distance between people and the data about global phenomenon, phenomena they are part of. Both projects are produced within the European Data Journalist Network as the result of a collaboration between OBC Trans Europa and Sheldon Studio. The data team at OBC Trans Europa processed the data you will see in both projects, and then Sheldon Studio stepped into the process. But let's start with global, sorry, local climate change. Uh, we tried reshaping the climate change perception connecting European citizens with the climate data regarding the places they care about. Data came from the WERA open data set provided by the European Copernicus program. It collects temperature on a daily basis all over the European territory from 1961 to 2019. So it means 40 years of daily temperature on the whole continent. You can imagine the huge size of the data set. The data set has an incredible granularity, so it means it's very accurate, even though it's often visualized like in this picture, so in, a, in an aggregated way, which honestly doesn't help in connecting the people behaviors or the people everyday life with the global phenomenon. Often, indeed, the climate change is perceived as a problem of others, 
it's not only due to aggregated visualization for sure. We should also keep in consideration that it's decades that climate communication rely on pictures like polar bears or the flood in Southeast Asia, and also due to our privileged condition of white European people. This is the reason why we decided to visualize each single European municipality through a density dot dot map with more than 100,000 dots. It is a never seen before map where the dot color indicate the amount of climate change that affected each European municipality. So we designed a map that relies on the concept of care. As humans, we are more open to read about, listen to, or in some cases, even activate for something we really care about. Passing from an aggregated to a dot-based map allows citizens to find their own places, the one they care about, such as, uh, for instance, the one they were born or married, or just another example, studied or had lovely holidays or simply just a good memory. Such a dot density offers a personal connection to specific places, offers a good starting point to engage people with a global and apparently distant phenomenon. So people can relate to the data about the places they care about, helping finally to reshape the climate perception because it is a problem of all of us, not only of others. Moreover, such a density reveals the European colder area are, are the most exposed to climate change. Uh, places such as Belgium, Norway, Finland, United Kingdom, Ireland and Hungary, as well as the Alps, are covered by many red dots. It means that their temperature, it means that the temperature increase, uh, increase more um, in, in, sorry, I made a mistake. It means their temperature increased more in the last 40 years compared to other areas such as the Greece, for instance, which temperature is generally hot, but is not wit witnessing a, a strong temperature increase in the last decades. Finally, that kind of map support the spotting of particular places that are witnessing a stronger climate change differently from the surroundings. Several are the factors that contribute to the climate increase the population rate, the land use, the overbuilding, the altitude, the proximity to water. So it returns a more accurate and punctual information. But it's not all. Once spotted your place, the project brings to a further level. We design a data storytelling page that automatically generates a story from the climate data. For instance, the adjective in, the, in, in use changes according to the values. Then we relied on a scrolling approach to support those visually unskilled readers in understanding what the chart is telling them. In this moment, for instance, I was scrolling the page. So the main climate chart sticks on the screen while the scroll activates other contextual information that explain the chart. Then the narration metaphorically zoom out. It started from the chosen place climate, climate and then moves um, to the uh, to the climate data. Sorry, to the climate data of the surroundings, then of the province, and finally of the region that contains the selected place. Finally, each place's play page closes with a data thumbnail. If reader share the places climate on the social network, the data thumbnail will be visualized. We generated more than 100,000 thumbnails that turned the readers into a sort of digital activist. The idea is to support their action with a simple but effective tool to spreading the debate among their social bubbles. As expected, the days following the, the project publication, we observed how many concerned people share the data thumbnails on their social network. And also many shared data thumbnails about unique and often unknown places due to this very granular nature of the data and the visualization. Then to close the first case study, the climate change is unfortunately the most crucial issue we will deal in the future. So you are always in time for visiting and sharing the project among your network to support a stronger 
climate awareness and care. Then moving to the other project I would like to reflect on is called Mapping Diversity. It is an online tool available to all to monitor the inclusivity on the street names. Just to be clear, it is certainly not enough to change the street names to find ourselves living in a more equal society. But at the same time, a more equal society should question which stereotypes and collective imaginaries are committed. For instance, as the Black Lives Matter protest reminded us, it is mainly a question of memory. It is about the legitimation of the past and the construction of a collective historical memory on that past. Then, obviously, uh, it is a matter of representation. So how to and to what extent citizens feel represented and then included in their city. And lastly, a matter of positioning. So how majors intend to position the city they manage in relation to new sensitivities and needs. So mapping diversity is now part of a broader and more ambitious project that maps different dimension in the European um, in different dimension, yes, in European municipality street names. Indeed, we are now seeking for a budget to translate and extend the project. The road is long, but we are very we, we for sure we know we will can continue in our project. At this stage, we are in the beginning. The project focuses only on the Italian cities. So unfortunately, it is only in Italian. But I think it also it's pretty understandable. You will see later. We plan to find a new budget to allow readers to also contribute directly to the data mapping process and then to extend the project on a an European level with more languages, cities and also indicators. For instance, adding colonial heritage in the in the maps, so of, of, always in the street names. I'm just referring to that, or social status and different kind of culture. So let's focus on the gender gap, because it's our first step. To be clear, to be clear with first step, I do not mean that there are no similar projects before. For example, uh, there is the incredible work of Toponomastica Feminile. Of a project made by feminist a feminist group uh, about the Italian city street names, but unfortunately, it's not a visual project. It relies on a series of text on list, basically. Or we should also mention equal street name dot Brussels, which is an interactive map that visualizes the street the, the street name of uh, a few North European capitals. Or the social dynamic group project which deal with the gender and other topic on the street names of New York, Paris, Wien and London. Looking at this existing project, we felt the need to bring the issue outside the map and the feminist bubbles. So with this idea to embrace a broader audience, because even the gender gap in the street names, but in general, obviously, because we are talking on a global phenomenon, affects each and every one of us. So to allow an inexperienced audience to understand the phenomenon, we relied again on data scrolling approach to support the comprehension of all those who graphically or statistically are illiterate or just distant from the topic. This is, for instance, the home page. And since the beginning, it present in this case is another visualization on the whole data about the whole Italian cities we analyzed. Looking at the home page now, we will make it a little bit shorter, to be honest, because I think it is important to explain the contest and why it matters for sure, but probably offering first time visitors an interactive map to play with will be more engaging. So just move here. This is once the the, the, the home page ends close with a series of cities that you can explore. This is the scrolly telling of the city of Turin, for instance. Each map has an informative layer which comment basically what visitors are looking to. The storytelling pattern is always the same for each city. So it starts with the number of streets, then the number of streets named dedicated to people, then the number of those dedicated to men, then only to women, and then we made another 
let's say, filter. So removing from the, the women group, the one that are saints or, have, or are aristocratic, because many of the few way, streets dedicated to women usually belongs to Mary or, or uh, queens or um, aristocratic women due to obviously to historical issues. So in the end, if you just look at the final number, are very few. Moreover, again, we relied on a similar approach on, on, yes, on the similar approach we experimented with local climate change, providing visitors with some data thumbnails they can spread on their own social network. With the idea to obviously promote the project, but also promote and support readers in opening debates among their networks. And finally, we worked on combining qualitative and quantitative data to give a face, a name, a, a profession, obviously a body to the data, offering also another entry point to discover who were the women in your city. Again, uh, you are more than, alcohol, uh, more than welcome and always in time to discover the project, share it and following our social channel to discover when it will be available in other languages. But then to conclude how we did this project, we strongly relied on an interdisciplinary approach. So it means we involved scientists, designers, developers, experts, journalists, and even citizens in the design process. In order to keep them together, we relied on a co-design strategy to give all of them a voice and also a design which is inclusive as much as possible. Then we also designed it to support those visually unskilled readers, experimenting with scrolling strategies to support readers' graphical literacy skills. Then to address a broader audience that increasingly browse the internet through mobile and sometimes only through it, we always relied on the mobile first paradigm. Last but not least, as I was saying before, the some just one of the two projects uh, relies, uh, try to combine quantitative and qualitative data just to remind people that we are talking about people once with, with this data. Then a couple of other reflection, especially about mapping diversity. Unfortunately, in the last case, we couldn't rely on open data. It is a shame that many Italian cities lacks open data street names. So thanks to the collaboration within the European Data Journalist Network, we were able to rely on an algorithm that collect data from open street maps and combining other data with Wikidata to create this database. It is not uh, easy to, to develop this and we were very lucky from this point of view. And we will be very happy to also make this available to a broader audience as soon as the project uh, finds new resources to move on. Again, on mapping diversity, data are not perfect due to this algorithm which collects data from OpenStreetMap. Probably you already what OpenStreetMap is, is a source-crowded uh, source map. So sometimes some streets are not available simply because people never entered or created this data in the map. So um, it would be nice to have a broader support, not only on the digital level, but also organizing local events to get engage with local people to map their towns. Then to conclude, I would give you um, a nice statement from a book that is called Information Diet, written in 2015 by Clay Johnson. It is a nice book because it makes a metaphor between the junk food and the world of information, coining this concept of junk news. So as humans, we learn that junk food is very nice looking, is very nice smelling, but probably it's not very healthy. So in the same way, we educated our body, our brain to resist to the temptation of eating junk food every day. We should, how to say, educate our mind again to 
understand that junk news, so those news that are written to not to inform us, but to entertain us. So we should educate ourselves in order to resist, not to click every time we just see a picture of cats or news with strong titles. In this book it appears also this metaphor, which is, I think, very simple and very strong. So the internet is the single biggest creator of ignorance mankind has ever created, as well as the single biggest eliminator of that ignorance. So it means that basically it's up to us, I'm talking to designer, but also to all the citizens of the internet. So the way we populate the net depends on us. So we shouldn't stop complaining internet is bad because obviously it's very different from 10 years ago, but maybe sometimes reflect on your everyday action on the net and how you could improve the quality of the debate or stop spreading jack, funk, um, fake news and so on. So it's, yes, a sort of praise and for the future. So we are the one that could also influence the future of the internet. So every time you share something, please remember to this statement. So thank you. That's all from my side. Thank you so much, Matteo. That was a fantastic talk. And again, we're very grateful for you to stepping into Alberto's shoes, but we would have loved your talk in the yeah. early afternoon anyhow. So it's so a wonderful uh, information there for many of us. And of course, the questions are rolling in. I'm just going to get a few up for you right now. Wolfgang Egner writes, great presentation and very nice typography. Congratulations oh, to... <laughs> Congratulations to successful foundation of your studio. And he has two very different questions, as he puts it himself. Number one, how do you finance your projects? And number two, as you mentioned, vis literacy. What are methods you apply? For example, do you explain how to read and interact with a visualization? Yeah. So how to finance this project? Um, yes, we are part of the European Data Journalist Network, which is financed by an, uh, an European project. And we decided uh, as partner to offer our support in also creating um, data storytelling and visual journalist projects. So to be honest, we, 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 the, the budget we, we receive is not a big budget, but given the importance of this kind of project, the importance of the topic, but also of the impact it could have, because we are talking about projects, especially the one on climate change, which are open to all the European audience. It's not just focusing on Italy or so we decided uh, to, 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 even if the budget was not so, so big to, to make this project, because we really believe in the, in design and uh, in the social, let's say in the social design. So, as designer, we would like to, to create a better world and a better internet. So yes, we, we, we are part of this network. This network is also open to other newspapers they want to bring in. And there's always a periodical call for financing new project or um, to share data and build up new, new articles based on data. About the literacy, it's, yes, we, we always have in mind that sometimes readers are not really literate. Uh, so obviously we cannot replace years of education because currently, in, in my personal opinion, the problem is now that young European citizens are very educated in terms of graphical and media literacy. Uh, the, the most problematic category, in talking about society, is are the elder people, probably these people that are out from the school path, but still use internet. And so how to take care of them? Obviously, we cannot replace school, as I was saying, but probably if you have in mind that some of the, the, the readers of your project are not really able to understand a chart, Maybe, yes, we, we, you know, we are experimenting scrolling because um, it allows to focus on a single content per time because you cannot scroll the whole project. And then this content sticks and provide and the scroll provides other information to explain a little bit how the chart works. Then probably another way to improve education or 
the yes the literacy of the elder people is to create you relying on a transmedia approach i mean not only digital but also connecting digital project with the physical dimension so for instance there are a few but very interesting project about uh, pollution where you, you from a, a digital map you also are connected to specific places and if visit these places in your city you find physical information or physical visualization that at the same time connects with the digital part and this approach allows also to inform different kind of people in different places using different media probably the most appropriate thank you so much we have another question here from simon steuer opening up data and learning the skills takes time as you said how can these skills be integrated in an organization so that the need for outside experts could be reduced hmm. wow well, uh, again it takes time and especially at least in my experience in putting new skills in organization you have to sometimes to force yourself using that skill because the a very common situation at least in my experience you train a team you train an organization but then if you don't need it probably your brain very easily forget it so or you have to force yourself to to to, to use in your everyday activity or in other ways trying to to train on these new things otherwise the risk is that yes you learn something but in the same way it's very easy to forget things so yeah. i mean after the training should be some something that allows this information be used <laughs> Thank you so much, Matteo. And uh, I'm sure many people will follow up with you in the short amount of time we have after the final speech online with the swap card, and they'll probably reach out to you directly as well.